Good morning, good morning. If you guys have your Bibles, please open to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter three. You know, I appreciate how John began prayer. He reminded us well that there's a lot going on in our world and and praise God at any time Christ can come and redeem us from these troubles. But in the meantime, it brings a valid question. You know, it's it's an obvious reality that we are in a cultural war. There are different ideologies and opinions and worldviews that clash in every decision being made, whether it's at a national level, an international level, or even within our, our community here. And the question is, what do we do as Christians? How do we conduct ourselves? What do we, how do we interpret and understand what's going on in our world around us? And what is the answer? We know the answer is the gospel, but how does the gospel address and reach these issues? And if we were to survey God's Word and ask that question, it becomes pretty clear the answer of how God brings the Gospel. And that is through the church. The local church is the means of bringing the Gospel to our communities, to our nation, and to our world. And as one pastor wisely and soberly put it, there is no plan B. There is no plan B. And this is hard for us to understand because there are so many problems in our church, is there not? And all of these problems make it very ineffective for the gospel. Sometimes we wonder if it's even capable of bringing the gospel because of the politics that happens in local churches. The hurt, the pain, or the country club mentality, we're all in our little comfort zone and it's just the American thing to do to do church. But when we look at the, the book of Acts, We see the dynamic life of this local body together, growing together, and every day people are being added to to come to know the Lord, and, and nothing stops them. Nothing stops them. They're whipped, they're beaten, they're persecuted, they're killed, and every time they're spread out, the gospel goes forth even more. The gospel cannot be killed by our culture. The world cannot kill the gospel. But what can hinder the gospel is the church. Because we are the means to bring the gospel to the world. And so as we consider that answer, that brings us to a more important question for us this morning. How will we as the Upper Room Bible Church be obedient to that call? Is the church just about us? Don't get me wrong, there is a need for us to shepherd amidst ourselves. Take care of each other, to grow in godliness. But what about the people outside our doors? What about those that we know that are in the hospital? The people on the streets, people in our communities. How will the upper room bring the gospel to them? And so this morning we're in a significant passage for 1 Timothy. Paul here summarizes not only the theme of this letter, but the theme of the pastoral epistles, all Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And in this we have a fresh picture of what the church is all about. We have a fresh picture of this call we are speaking of. And when it really comes down to it, and I hope I have preached this consistently, as Paul has made it very explicit here in the text, the church is about Jesus Christ. It is built on a person. It's not a systematic theology. It's not built on the personality of a speaker or the charisma of a group. It's built on a person who was crucified, buried, and rose again, and is now preached among the world and promised to come back in glory for the faithful and for the judgment of the wicked. And so with this in mind, let us begin in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, and believed on in the world. 
taken up in glory. So as we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. And as we listen to the words of your servant Paul, may we listen to your spirit. May we hear, O Lord, how we as a church, as the Upper Room Bible Church and all who are here today, may answer that call of bringing the gospel to those who need it. You came not for the righteous, O Lord, but you came for the sick and the needy. How do we, O Lord, align with that? How can we learn from this word this morning for us to obey you and to worship you? We just give it all to you and pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. This passage is is brief, but, but powerful. It gives us three different things about the church and three different things about our call to godliness together as a body. The first is we understand that godliness is lived. The first thing is that godliness is lived. Recognize immediately in the beginning of verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. As we've noted multiple times, the point of Timothy, the point of what Paul is trying to urge the church is godliness, a godliness that can be seen, a godliness that testifies of the gospel that they believe in. We've already gone through the different elements that Paul has talked about on how this godliness manifests. It's it's through true teaching, it's through prayer as a body, it's through leadership and and service to each other. And then he, he brings it back again to that point, I write these things so that you may know how to behave. The gospel is not just a mental acceptance that we now have right knowledge, but it is manifested in our lives. The person of Christ is not just something that we can find in a theology book, but is living and embodied in the Word and in our lives. A godliness lived. And one of the questions that I've heard is asked a couple times, and I think it's fair to bring to this passage, how does that relate to we as Christians when we consider the call of grace. The Bible says very clearly we are saved by grace, not by works. But yet, so clearly does Paul talk about good works very frequently. In fact, if we were to go to Titus and just look at Titus, um, in Titus chapter 3, turn with me there really quick, Titus chapter 3. He emphasizes this call again. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 8. Titus 3, verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Look down at verse 14. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. One of the major themes of the pastoral epistles is good works. Good works. Make sure... They do good works. But how does that relate? I thought we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. This is a fundamental question to ask. Especially when it considers the idea of salvation. Is our salvation threatened if we don't do good works? These are hard questions in in the relationship of the gospel. And if we had time this morning, I would love to walk through different passages, whether it's the Gospels where Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, you will know a tree by their fruits. If we were to look at Paul's other writings in Romans 6, he says, shall we continue in sin now that we have grace? God forbid. You are no longer slaves of sin, but slaves of righteousness. If we were to look at Peter's writing, he makes it unmistakable in the first chapter, be holy, for I the Lord am holy. In John... Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In James, he says, you have faith without works? Great. The demons believe. But clearly they're not saved. So what is this relationship? How do we understand this? And I believe the answer is in this exact passage. Because if we were to look down again at verse 16 of 1 Timothy 3, He comes back again to what the church is all about. It's about the person, Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace through the work of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God, we're not left to our sinful selves anymore now, are we? We are new creations and we follow Him. We are saved by grace, not of works, 
But now we live after Christ. We follow him. The call of discipleship, again, is not just this right information that now we all know what's right and everyone else in the world is wrong. But now we have a person. We know God personally. And Christ says, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Pick up your cross. Deny yourselves. And you will find eternal life. You will know a disciple by their fruits. You will see a changed life. That grace is not just, again, a correction of your knowledge. It's a transformation of your life. So the point of, again, of 1 Timothy is that that grace would so manifest itself And yet again, we come to that struggling reality that our churches do not manifest that grace often, do they? Too often our churches get, again, so caught up in a single person or they allow personal issues to destroy fellowship amidst brethren. And yet, it's that same grace that God says you are called to one body and one God and joined in one fellowship in the Spirit. We have to challenge ourselves. How do we see the church? How do we see our local bodies? Are they a lost cause? If they're a lost cause, so is the gospel. Because again, the primary means, the only means for the gospel to reach this world is through the church. There is no plan B. So we may ask ourselves, at this point as well, should we continue to think churches should be customized to our personal preferences? Like a frozen yogurt shop, we just kind of pick what we want, put little sprinkles here, and if you don't like it, throw it out, you'll get another one. No wonder we don't commit to our local church bodies. We just kind of hop around to find what we like, whether it's this kind of worship or this style of teaching or this age group. Yet ultimately, God says, all people are to join together. We are to join together to fellowship of all ages, of all backgrounds, and worship God. Because the church, again, is not about us. If it's about us, we're worshiping ourselves. We're not worshiping Christ. That godliness and grace must manifest in how we relate to each other, in our commitment to our fellow brothers and sisters in this body. And that addresses another key error. Church so often is seen as an add-on and not central. Just part of the week. Move around churches as we so seem. Yet when we look at the life of the disciples in the early church, church was not something that just added on to their life. It was their life. There was never a moment outside of church. They fellowship with each other. They broke bread together. They gave to whoever was at need. They moved and, and let the persecution spread them. The boldness they had and the Spirit was working and, and people, the lost, were coming to be saved from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And it was because of their faithfulness the gospel has reached here. For if they gave up on each other, the gospel would not be here. But praise be to God, the church is not up to men, now is it? It's up to a living God. And that brings us to the second point, what Paul shows here about the church. He gives us pictures of the church and how this godliness is preserved. Verse 15, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Here we have three significant pictures of what the church is all about. Number one is the church is a family. We are a household. As Paul so beautifully teaches, we are children adopted into the faith. We are no longer strangers and foreigners. We've been brought into the family, brought into the covenants of God's called out people. And more than children, Galatians 4, we are Heirs with Christ. Fellow heirs to the inheritance of heaven and the glories that it all contains. But again, we must ask the question, are we acting as a family? Are we looking out for each other in that way? And I've been so encouraged by the work that God's done in this local church. I could go over all the different ways I've seen. I've been a part of every Bible study that's been here. And it's just amazing to see what God's doing since this church has started. You have all the significant ingredients of what a church needs for, for where it's to go and God desires, but the question is, will you capitalize on those ingredients? Will you lose sight of what God's doing? Because here's the thing, very often we get comfortable. 
It's just part of our lives, and the church is doing fine. We give our tithe every Sunday. They're doing fine. But is the gospel reaching the community? Do we embrace people who come in? Are we seeking those that they can come in? We are a family. Right from the beginning, Christ says, who are my mother, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he reaches out to the disciples around him in Matthew 12 and he says, whoever does the will of my father, the will of God, they are my brothers and sisters and mother. And Paul continues this theme here. Even down in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, if you were to look really quickly, 1 Timothy 5, the first two verses, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men, as brothers, older women, as mothers, younger women, as sisters, in all purity. We're dedicated to our biological families, are we not? Some of us struggle with that, but for honest, we love our parents. We love our siblings. If any of them were in the hospital, we'd be there in a heartbeat. My dearest friend, his grandma, was told she had hours to live, and they all flew in. His sister flew in from Texas. They flew in from Northern California. He dropped his ministry he was doing and drove down to have the last few hours of her life. And just the love that she had as all her family came around her hospital bed. Do we do that when one of ours is sick? Do we do that when we know someone that we've been praying for whose loss is in the hospital? We're praying for Ed Manning right now. Ed Manning and Martha talked about that on the email burst. And are we going to see him and letting him know we love him? We've been praying for him so he can see a face and not just hear a voice. Because when he sees that, who do you think he sees? You think he sees us? Some person would go out of their way of life to go see a guy that they don't even know? He's going to see Christ. He was walking on paths to certain places and would stop and see a blind man come to him and say, do you believe? I do. And he saw. That the early church would walk by a man they had seen for years and years, 40 years lame. And they would stop and say, I don't have money for you, but I'll give you what I do have. And he picks him up and he walks. And whether God works miracles that today, it's a different question. We know God works miracles through his church who is faithful to his gospel to let people know they're loved by the creator who made them, who is there at their birth, no matter what their life is like now. We are a family. Secondly, we behave the household of God, and we are a, we are the, which is the church of the living God. The word church simply means called out ones, and it goes right back to the beginning when God called out Israel. And the connection here and the picture here, they build on each other, is that we are a family we are the dwelling place of God. Why did God call out Israel? He called them out that they may be his people and he would be their God, that he would dwell in their midst. The center of Israel was what? It was not the king. It was not the prophets or the priests. It was the tabernacle where the word of God was preached and the presence of God dwelt. And now here he says, you are the church of the living God. You are that dwelling place. He says it in Corinthians, you are the temple. Why do you allow sin in your lives? Why do you condone sin? Why do you let these false teachers rise up and teach a false gospel? If this is my dwelling place. Because praise be to God, he's not limited to one area in Jerusalem. God says, I am with you. When you gather together and you worship in spirit and truth, you are my dwelling place. The Holy Spirit is sealed in to our lives. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. We are called out and consecrated for his worship. But what distinguishes us? What distinguishes us as a church? The very presence of God. If we had time, I would love to turn over, but I just want to summarize. In Exodus 33, I was in this for my devotions, and I couldn't get past it. Here is Israel. They've been given the law, and they messed it up right from the beginning. They made a golden calf and said, this is our deliverer, right? They have this false God. So they're in repentance, they're just praying that God would forgive them and, and Moses would come back again with the instruction of God. And you know what God says? He says, go Moses, go bring the people into the promised land. I will deliver you from all the nations there. I will provide everything I promised, but I will not be with you. Now can you imagine that? 
Think about that for a second. They have everything that God's promised, all the good stuff, the blessings of the land, the fruitfulness of their work, all the nations, military triumph, they'll be cast out and they'll have that promised piece of property that God said to Abraham will be his. But I will not be with you. If I can compare it today, it would be like God saying, I'll end all of your worries, I'll take you to a glorious place, heaven with all of its wonders, but I will not be there. Would we want it? And we may say no, but it asks a very fundamental question of what do we truly desire in this life? Is it just peace from our problems? Is it just a satisfaction in our souls? Or is it God himself? Moses plead with God saying, if you will not go, we will not go. Because, and he says this, how are we different from the nations? That you dwell in our midst. This is why we exist as a people, is that you physically dwell in our midst. And this is the same for the church today. We exist not for programs. We exist not to have a social outing. We exist not for each other. We exist for the worship of that God who dwells in our midst when we gather. And we exist that his glory may be spread to the nations and to this valley we live in, to our neighbors, to our families. Recognize how he is identified. Which is the church of the living God? This God who dwells in our midst is not a figment of our imagination. He's not Pete's dragon. He is the living God. And this is extremely important for the church in Ephesus at this time. Remember again, they were a significant port city. They had all kinds of cultures come in. They had gods and idols all over the place. And they had the wondrous temple of Artemis. Everyone praised Artemis. When someone threatened the worship of Artemis, the whole city was in an uproar. And here Paul writes to them, you are the temple of the living God. It was intentional. And even though today nobody may worship Artemis or the idols of that time, we all know there are plenty of things that distract our worship today. Our careers, our money, our families, whatever it might be, it does not matter what form it takes. If it takes away our love and devotion to God, it's an idol. And we do not serve that idol. We were not made for that idol. We were made for the living God. Look at the third image. We have the household of God, the church, the dwelling place of the living God, and we have a pillar in buttress of the truth. This brings again to that point of the question of how do we reach our culture? How is truth preserved? How does it advance to the nations? It's through the church. I love the imagery that one writer talked about when he spoke of this passage. He says, you know, the temple of Diana was massive. It had a hundred strong columns, and each column was like 60 feet high, and it held up a massive marble roof. And so you can imagine the people listening to this letter and hearing pillar and buttress of the truth. Paul is saying, you also, like those columns, hold up the truth of God. The question is, do we? Do our lives advance the gospel or does it disgrace it? Because the testimony of the gospel is based on us, is it not? One of the hardest things whenever I enter a workplace with my fellow workers at Costco is to find out what were the Christians like that they last talked to. And I mean that. I get the reputation of all the Christians. Oh yeah, that guy over there, he was a youth pastor. Man, that guy got drunk so many times at employee parties. Oh yeah, well, I, I, oh, he's a Christian? Oh, I, I could never tell. Didn't know. And that gets linked to me as the reputation of when I say I am a Christian. But praise be to God, that's not the end of the story for those coworkers, is it? I have the responsibility, as we do in all of our contexts, our workplaces, our communities, to hold up, to preserve the truth of God. That they can tell it not by my words only, but how I behave. They see Christ as they hear Christ in my life. And that's why ultimately it doesn't matter really how much money we pour into this building, how many programs we have or what's listed on our bulletin, does it? What matters is, are we preserving and exalting Christ? Because the local community is not suffering because we just don't have the right program yet for our church. 
Okami community is suffering because we are not bringing Christ to them. And that leads us to the third point that we see in this passage in verse 16. We have a godliness lived, we have a godliness pictured and preserved, and now we have a godliness confessed. Verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. The utmost goal of godly leadership, remember, this is coming again out of elders and deacons, and the utmost goal as the church, as he's calling out all of the church and how we're to behave, is to guard the gospel. And this isn't, again, just about debating and being familiar with the academic arguments out there and trying to make sure that we can argue for the gospel. The question is, are we living the gospel? Because someone can always come up with a rebuttal. Someone always can try to find an excuse to not believe in arguments, but they cannot argue with your life. They cannot argue with the transformed life we have and the grace of God. And this is important because look down at chapter 4, verse 1, the verse right afterwards. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. It's not a coincidence. He's talking about upholding the truth. He's talking about the great confession of godliness. And then he warns because people will walk away from the faith. And one of the hardest things for me to hear, and I'm, I know I'm not the only one, but I just for me, when I hear that someone says, I don't believe the gospel because of this Christian, or this pastor. It brings a sober reality again that our lives are not separate from the gospel and the church. If we claim to be a Christian, we claim to follow Jesus, your life is a testimony and either will build up the gospel or tear it down. And God does that. I'll never forget one conversation I had. I've told this story many times, so forgive me for saying it again, but I remember I was sharing truth with this guy. I was 18 at the time and I was uh, working for an air conditioning company. I was just selling air conditioning units. It was an interesting first job, standing in one place for five hours hoping someone would stop by for air conditioning. But um, I'll never forget, this guy comes up, and we turn from air conditioning to the gospel. How? I have no idea. But we did. And he just starts nailing me with these questions. He's got all kinds of questions, and I get 10 seconds before I'm interrupted for another question. I'm talking just varying categories of science and scripture and, and all these things. And, and finally, he comes to a question about my life, and I tell him exactly how I live according to God's word, and he is just stunned. And he tells me, I have two siblings, both of them are pastors, and they've cheated on their wives, they're, they're unfaithful in all these different ways, but man, I just, you walk the walk. And I don't share that to say, look how great I am. I share that to say, the testimony of a changed life can counteract the testimony of falsehood. That this man who has two siblings who are pastors and have slandered the gospel can all of a sudden change his mind when he sees an 18-year-old selling air conditioning units sharing the gospel with him. It does not matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're in this pulpit or not. Your life can bring the gospel to a lost soul. That's why the simplicity of the call of Christ is right there in the beginning of Matthew. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. And I love how Luke kind of changes the wording a little bit. I'm sure there was another comment of Christ, but he says, from now on, you will be catching men. If the gospel is at work in our souls, we can be guaranteed the gospel will work at those around us. If the gospel is at work in this church, the gospel will work in our communities. We ultimately see here the high value God has for his church. The high value and stakes the gospel has been staked in the church. Because we guard this confession. And one thing that I was kind of taken back as I read this confession, you know, again, I'm a seminary student, so I read systematic theologies. It's it's a joy for me, you know, twist my arm to read a theology book. I just love it. And I you know, have these wonderful professors, and we always think things linearly. We list out all the doctrines, and we work through things and try to be very precise and preserve the faith in light of all the false doctrines that are out there. It's just, it sounds boring to you guys, but it's a joy for me, and maybe it's my theological nerd moment for the day. But as I read this passage, I I kept on thinking, Paul, why did you write that? Right? Now, why wouldn't you write like, you know, we believe in one God who's the Father, who's the creator of all things, sustains all things, and we're justified by faith alone, or through grace alone, through faith. And he doesn't say that. Look what he says. He, 
was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The ultimate confession, the whole point of why we exist, the summation of the Christian faith is not found in a book or a theological discussion. It's found in a person. Praise be to God, we have this book that tells us all about Him. I love, and please turn with me to 1 John. I love how John begins his epistle. It illustrates this perfectly. 1 John, just the first chapter, and we'll start in the first verse. To, just to furnish this point. Chapter 1, verse 1, 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, with our eyes which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now we hear word, we think of spoken word, we think of teaching, we think of some kind of list or statement, but listen how he describes this word. He has heard of it, he has seen, he has touched it. This word of life, verse 2, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Does John list a doctrinal statement? Don't get me wrong, I'm not back on doctrinal statements. They're absolutely necessary. If there's anything you guys have heard me talk a lot about, it's false doctrine, precision of doctrine. But what does he say? How does he begin his letter? With a person. I have seen this person. I have heard this person. And I'm telling you about this person. And what is the point? Don't miss this. Look again at verse 3. We have seen, we have heard, we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. God's desire is not just for individuals, but for a people. The gospel has come, it has infiltrated the world to save people that they could be part of God's people. We are not lone rangers. Our lives are not islands in God's view. We are a nation called out for the worship of the living God. And that is manifested specifically in the local church. If the gospel does not lead us to fellowship, we have to ask, do we believe the true gospel? If we have no desire for the church... Do we know this Jesus? Because he loved these sheep. John 10, I will lay down my life for the sheep. So here we see these pictures of the church in 1 Timothy, the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth, and it's all rooted in this mystery of godliness. Mystery, by the way, is just simply something that's been hidden that is now revealed. It's not something mystical or something that's an enigma we have to figure out. It's just it's been veiled in times past and now revealed today. And who has been veiled and hinted at for centuries is the people of Israel. This promised deliverer that he would come and he would bring about this age of Eden all over again, the new creation, the new hope where sin is no more and tears are no more. Who is this promised deliverer that we now know today? And that the church is supposed to be all about. This church is supposed to be all about. So where I want to end today is with the sobering fact that Paul teaches within this passage. If our church is not about Jesus in every area, when people are welcomed in, when people are discipled afterwards, when the gospel is shared in every program, that if it's not about Jesus, it's not church. It's not church. Welcome to a country club at that point. Welcome to a social club and gathering. Because Paul makes it clear. He moves swiftly from how we ought to behave as a church to we confess. Not I confess. It wasn't just about Paul confessing this or the pastor confessing, but we, all of us, confessing this person in all that we do. And it is no wonder that in the verse right before John 3.16 that we all know by heart, John 3.15, he says, if you lift Christ up, people will be drawn to me. Because again, it's not about we need to wait for a pastor 
as pastor to rally us up and get our church going with direction and vision. It's not about that in Scripture. It's about lifting Jesus up together. It's not my job only. It's not the elder's job only. It's not the deacon's job only. It's not your job only. It's all of our job together, lifting up Christ that people may find the hope of the world. Let's end in prayer. And after we pray, we have the privilege of dedicating some beautiful babies. So we'll have the family begin to come up here. Let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I think of just the churches in this valley, God, and how much we have disgraced your gospel. And I praise you for the work that you have done despite our weaknesses and imperfections. My heart is heavy for those who are burned out by churches who have seen a false Christ and the lack of love of people or a false gospel that has led them to error. Lord, may this church, may the upper room, O oh God, and all here, hear your words and root their lives in you, Jesus. And when we read your word, it is to be a reflection of our own lives. You say your word is a mirror. God, let us not see ourselves in our sinfulness, but may we see you, Jesus. May your life overflow into every part of this church and each of us individually. May we bring your gospel to the nations and to this valley. Praise you, Lord, that you have not given up on the church. You have not given up on us. That, Lord, you have started a work in each of our lives. You have started a work here in the upper room. You will finish it. May our hearts be soft and pliable. May your spirit fill and lead. And pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.